strength. Ponder that for a moment, people of God. When you worship, He will give you strength. So whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing, just know as you press in today, as you worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords, you will be strengthened in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, amen. Let's give God a great big shout of praise. Resound to you. 
that is high he is higher for every burden that is great he is greater for every valley that is deep he is deeper still more than you can know Welcome to Lifehouse Fellowship. Turn around and greet somebody here this morning. Hug a neck and then you may take your seat.
Lighthouse. If this is your first time with us, please fill out a guest card near you. You can take your card to the Connection Center to pick up a special gift, our way to say thank you for worshiping with us today. This summer, be a part of Summer Drive. Refresh your outlook, focus your direction, and discover new adventures. From Rock Hound to baseball to a pool party at Doug Russell and life nights every Wednesday, you won't want to miss the fun. Check the events tab on the LHF app for details. Promotion Sunday is June 10th. This is a time that we recognize and pray for all those moving up to their next grade level and honor our high school graduates. Get your cameras ready and let's celebrate together. Real Women Ministries meet the second and fourth Mondays at 7 p.m. at Lifehouse Fellowship. Discover how to own your life story and use it for God's glory. In just a moment, we will receive our tithes and offerings. To give securely with your mobile device, text LHF to the number 77977 and follow the prompt. You can also go to lifehousefellowship.net or simply use an envelope provided on a chair back near you. The best way to stay up to date on the happenings at Lifehouse is the Lifehouse app. You can listen to sermons, check the events calendar, and so much more. Be sure to allow notifications so you can receive the latest updates from Lifehouse. Happy Mother's Day! We are so excited to celebrate all of our moms today. Don't miss your opportunity to get your family photo after service. Happy Mother's Day! It's a good day to celebrate moms. We're glad you're here. We hope you brought your mom with you. Don't forget to go out after service and get a picture made. They're free. We just we said, what's the one thing our mothers are always asking us? When am I going to get a picture? So now you can say, I've got one on the way, mom. So be sure to get out there and, and make sure you get one with your family before you leave today. We're so glad you're here. As you're preparing your giving, I want to share just a couple of things. A couple of weeks when we talked, uh, when I talked about giving, we were talking Talking about in Malachi chapter 3, how the people there had forgotten they were a covenant people. They were people in covenant and they lost track of that. So God says, come back into covenant with me. And the first step was to bring the tithes and offerings to God, but there was a next step. The next step was right here. Watch your words. Because he said, your words have been harsh against me. Your words have been stern against me. And he gave them this example. He said, you say, look how the wicked prosper. Look how the people who do evil seem to get further ahead. It just seems like the people who don't serve God live a better life. How many of you know we can get that mentality sometimes? And when we start thinking that way, it's a red flag. I'm forgetting that I'm a covenant person. I'm forgetting that I have a covenant with the Almighty God. And we have to always bring ourselves back. Our mouth is a sickle, and it reaps a harvest. And we want to use our words to reap the goodness of God in our lives. Amen? Psalm 37 verse 1 says, do not fret yourself because of evildoers, neither be envious against those who work unrighteousness. For they shall soon be cut down like grass and wither as the green herb. But trust in the Lord and do good. So shall you dwell in the land and feed surely on his faithfulness. And truly you shall be fed. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires and secret petitions of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Roll and repose and care. Uh, Roll and repose each care of your load upon him. Trust, lean on, rely on, and be confident also in him, and he will bring it to pass. And he will make your uprightness and right standing with God go forth as the light, and your justice and right as the shining sun of the noonday. Be still and rest in the Lord. Wait for him and patiently lean yourself upon him. Fret not because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked devices to pass. He's saying, get your mind off of other people and get your mind on God. Lean on, rest in the understanding that you are in covenant with God and he's got you. Amen. We don't have to get our eyes on other people. We don't have to compare ourselves with people in the world. I'll, the only person I'm comparing myself to is Jesus. Am I getting more and more like him every day? Amen. Let's all stand and let's bless the Lord this morning. 
Father, today our eyes are on you. Our eyes aren't on the people around us. Our eyes aren't on situations and circumstances. Our eyes are on you and our eyes are on your word. Help us be more like you. Help us to watch over our words, that we always speak truth, that we always speak righteousness, that we always use our words to build you up, God, to build up the kingdom of God. We thank you for the blessings that you've brought to us. And as we give today, we give with a worshipful heart. We love you and we thank you. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Ushers, you can serve the people.
before the King. And our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. We bow before the King. Oh, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, for he's worthy. Oh, he's worthy. He's worthy. Oh, he's worthy. For you are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Sing it out. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. One more time. You are worthy of it all.
that there is no other name that we can put our hope or our trust in, but in the name of Jesus Christ. It is at that name every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. It's at that name that every sickness must flee, that every demon has to go, that every chain has to fall. It is the name above all names. There is no ruler, there is no king, there is no power above the name of Jesus Christ. And we magnify you in this place this morning because you are worthy. We say great are you, Lord Jesus. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken for great are you lord it's your breath in our lungs so pour out your praise to him this morning for he's worthy of your praise you give life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope yeah. you restore every heart that
Come on. Pour out your praise. Pour out your praise. Pour it out. Where's your victory? Pour it out. For he's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our praise. Let us shout. A rock in this house this morning. Pour out. I receive healing. I receive freedom. I receive victory. Oh, I receive the peace of God. I receive his love. I receive it all. All that you have for me, God. I receive it now. I come in one way, but I'm leaving changed by the anointing. I'm leaving changed by his glory. Hallelujah. We worship. 
worship you. We worship you. We worship you. God, you're so good to us. Come on, just one more time. Let's just raise our hands all across this congregation. You know what you're doing when you raise your hands? You're just saying, Father, I surrender it all. I surrender my life to you. I surrender my heart to you. I surrender my will to your will. I surrender, God, to you. Father, I love you today. We love you today. Oh, God, you're so awesome. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Isn't the Lord good? Isn't the Lord good? <laughs> man, oh man, oh, we can just stay right there all day long. The glory of the Lord, His anointing is here. Praise God. You know, as you're standing today, have an awesome responsibility as believers. To take what we just received. And to share. I was sensing in my heart there's a great outpouring of an evangelism and revival sweeping across this nation but you hope you heard me say it revival for revival to start it first has to start here for the for the move of God to start it first has to start here and I sense every one of you are pursuing and stepping you're growing in the things of God. And I want to encourage you to keep it up. Keep shining bright for Him. Keep sharing the love of Christ. You know, my brother, Matt, he told me, Pastor, it's amazing what God can do when you turn it all around and you start looking to Him as the author and the developer and the finisher of our faith. God wants to work on your behalf today. Know this, that he's for you. He's not against you. Amen. To this platform, I'm about to invite my great uncle, whom I honor and I cherish. I've sat under many ministries and been to a lot of meetings I've heard a lot of men, preachers, teachers, evangelists, apostles, pastors, you name them. I've heard them. But there's none that I've ever heard that has inspired me more to live out the kingdom of God than my Uncle Keith. And my prayer today is that you would have the same heart to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church today. And to this platform, I would love for you to give my great uncle a great Permian Basin welcome as he comes to this platform, Pastor Keith Johnson. saying great uncle means that uh, I'm not great 
you know, <laughs> second generation, you understand that. It's always good to be at Life House with the Suttons and got a lot of family here. Our, my oldest daughter is on staff here. Many of you know her, Amy. And uh, one of my favorite nieces, Terry Lynn, which is Jeremy's mom. And I, I know what a special day Mother's Day is. I pastored for 46 and a half years. And uh, there was about two special Sundays of the year that I very seldom gave up my pulpit. And that was Mother's Day and Father's Day. Because I knew that would be a great time to teach uh, the life principles taught in the Word of God about motherhood and fatherhood. Nothing more important in the whole world than fatherhood and motherhood. Amen. Because as goes the home, so goes the church. As goes the home, so goes society. And it starts with father and mother. Amen. Amen. So uh, I know it's, it's um, a big deal to give up your pulpit on Mother's Day. And I'm honored to be here to uh, talk to you from my heart, from God's heart about some principles of motherhood. Amen? Amen. Uh, much could be said, I, like I said, uh, 46 and a half years, I, I know I probably preached 40 Mother's Day messages. So I have lots of material. But I told Pastor before I came today that I didn't have any set notes. Sometimes that's not good because notes help you to know when you're finished. And uh, I don't have any set notes. I did scribble a few down in my room um, before I came this morning. Uh, I had a little article here I wanted to read before I, I get to the scriptures. And I will get to the scriptures. Um, <clears throat> it's entitled, Women Are Made for the Long Haul. Mom and Dad were watching TV when Mom said, I'm tired. It's getting late. I think I'll go to bed. So she went to the kitchen to make sandwiches for the next day. This lunches. Rinsed out popcorn bowls. Took meat out of the freezer for supper the following evening. Checked the cereal box levels. Filled the sugar container. Put spoons and bowls on the table. Started the coffee pot for brewing the next morning. Then she put some wet clothes in the dryer and put a low clothes in the wash. Ironed a shirt. Secured a loose button. She picked up the game pieces left on the table and put the telephone back into the drawer. She watered the plants, emptied the wastebasket, hung up a towel to dry. She yarned and stretched, uh, yawned and stretched and headed for the bedroom. She stopped by the desk and wrote a note to the teacher, counted out some cash for the field trip and pulled a textbook out from hiding under the chair. She signed a birthday card for a friend, addressed and stamped the envelope, wrote a quick note for the grocery store, and she put both in her purse. Mom then washed her face, three-in-one cleanser, and put on her night solution, an age-fighting moisturizer. I've tried to bathe in that, doesn't work. <laughs> Brushed and flossed her teeth, filed her nails. Dad called out. Thought you were going to bed. Well, I'm on my way, she said. She put some water into the dog's dish and put the cat outside. Then made sure the doors were locked. She looked on each of the kids and turned out their bedside lamps and hung up a shirt, threw some dirty socks in the hamper. And had a brief conversation with the one up still doing homework. In her room, uh, she set the alarm, laid some clothes out for the day, straightened up the shoe rack, she added three things to her six most important things to do list. She said her prayers, visualized the accomplishment of her goals. And about that time, Dad turned off the TV and announced to no one in particular, I'm going to bed. And he did it without another thought. <laughs> I'm telling off on us, on we men, because that's about the way it is. We say, we're going to bed. We just go and go to bed. Women by the, got about 30 minutes work to do before they can get into bed. 
I'd like for you to take your Bibles, if you have them with you today, and I trust you do. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have now to attend to your word. And I pray that as we read your word, we will incline our ear unto your sayings, because we know revelation comes by hearing. It's not just hearing what I've got to say, but it's hearing the Holy Spirit. And we know that your word is letter, but it's also spirit. And I pray that we will catch the spirit of the letter today, that our hearts will be enlightened so we can see as you see, so we can do what you would have us to do. Thank you for liberty and freedom in this house today to teach, to preach, and to receive that revelation that only comes from hearing. And we'll give you praise, glory, and honor for all that you do in our hearts and lives this day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Paul, an apostle, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience. Your conscience is the voice of your spirit. Amen. The, the, uh, the body has a voice and its feelings. The soul has a voice and its reason. But your spirit has a voice and you are a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body. But the voice of your spirit is your conscience. And Paul talks about that a great deal in his writing. So he says, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience. In other words, when you're off, your conscience will tell you you're off. And a lot of people sear their conscience so they don't have to listen to what it's saying to them. And if you sear your conscience, you're in dangerous territory. You always want to keep your conscience sensitized, sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And I believe one of the best ways to do that is to pray in the Holy Spirit. I really believe that. I believe we ought to pray. Paul said, I pray in tongues more than y'all. And those Corinthians really like praying in tongues. But Paul said, I pray in tongues more than y'all. Why? Because he wanted to keep his spirit sensitive to God, to the Holy Spirit, so his conscience could speak to him. So I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. You see, Timothy was a spiritual son of the Apostle Paul. And I don't see anyone any closer. There were several spiritual signs that Paul had, but I don't see any, in scripture, I don't see anybody any closer than Timothy was to the great apostle. Now notice what he says in verse five, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother and your mother, and I am persuaded is in you also. One thing you know about God, you need to know about God if you don't know this, is God is generational he thinks generational you know when he cut covenant with Abraham he was not just thinking about Abraham and that's why the Bible Moses you know supposedly wrote the Pentateuch first five books of the Bible and uh, and really and truly Moses talks about the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob He was talking about three generations there, but he could have gone on and listed more. But the point he's trying to get to is this, that when God talks to you, he's just not talking about helping you. He's talking about helping you so you can help the next generation. Because the promises that God has for you is not only for you, it's for your children. Huh? And so God does that, you know, God is so big, we can't contain God. This building can't contain God. This city can't contain God. As great as Texas is, <laughs> it can't contain God. Amen. As great as the United States is, it can't contain God. As great as America is, it can't contain God. As great as the world is, it can't contain God. God is greater. 
we, we just don't have a concept of how great God is. We sing these songs, and I wonder, you know, if it's not just emotions that really stir us when we're singing, and we're not really concentrating on the words that we're singing. God is so much bigger. Hey, you, you know, when little David, and I got to be careful not get on all these rabbit trails because we'll be here till tomorrow. But, but you know, when David was out keeping his father's sheep, and he 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 was the psalmist, and he would sing these psalms, and he would sing the word, and he would sing to God, and and and, and he would sing about God's greatness, and. And, and the lion came up to destroy his father's sheep, and he, he killed the lion. Yes. Now, how was he able to do that? Because he saw the greatness of God. He saw that he was covenant. The lion didn't have a covenant. Yes. When you're covenant, you're greater than whatever it is coming against you. Amen. When the bear came to destroy his father's sheep, he understood who he was. He was a covenant child. And the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He may send a lion to do it. He may send a bear to do it. He may send a friend to do it. He may send somebody else to do it. But we're greater than that. We're greater than any opposition that would ever come against us. And what we got to do, what the devil tries to do, is he tries to control your focus so he can control your direction. He breaks your focus to get your eyes off of God onto the problem so the problem becomes magnified and you get overwhelmed by it. But God wants you to understand how big he is. He's much greater than the problem. David saw that God, his God, was much bigger than the lion and the bear. And that same thing played out when he went to take some food to his brothers and went over there and saw Goliath intimidating the body of Christ. And he said, who does this uncircumcised Philistine think he is? This guy doesn't have a covenant. He's big, but God is bigger. And when you know you're on God's side, then the devil's up against that. Amen. Praise him pretty good. Amen. But you just got to understand that God wants you to always be conscious of his greatness. And he wants to be great for you, but he wants to be great in you. And if you understand his words on your lips is the same as his words coming out of his lips. Are you listening? That's the truth. So who do you think you are? I think I'm a child of God. I think I'm a son of God. I think you're a daughter of God. If Jesus lives in you, greater is he who is in you than he is in the world. Now, you either believe this or you're just, you're just talking, you know. You just got religiosity. And we don't need any more religion. The world is full of religion. What we're doing here today is not a religious program. This is Christianity. It's God-breathed. The life of God is in us. And when we begin to lift our voices to God, we release that awesome power. Amen. That's why words are important. That's why we got to speak words. We got to decree and we got to declare what God has said. Not what I feel, not what I think, not what my emotions are trying to talk to me about or what the negative, the left wingers are trying to say to me. I got to decree and declare what God has said. And if I will decree and declare what God has said, then I am releasing the power of God into the atmosphere to change. That's who we are. We're change agents. We're sent here to change the world, not let the world to change us. And I really don't have time to talk about that. That would take a series. But Paul says, I want you to see this. Paul said this. He said, Timothy... I know your grandmother, she was a godly woman. She just didn't keep this to herself. She trained your mother. And that same boldness, that same faith, that same belief that was in your grandmother, she instilled it, taught it, trained it to her daughter. And then your mother didn't just keep that to herself. She took that same boldness that started, that same spiritual DNA that started in her mother. She took that and she instilled it in you. So that you're the third generation. 
And you know each generation ought to e exceed the other one. Come on. You know every generation ought to stand on the shoulders of the previous generation and go higher and go further. We ought to train our children to go beyond. I told my boys, I said, boys, if you'll obey God, if you'll obey dad, mom, if you'll live holy, live right. Now, holiness, folks, you know what holiness is? People don't know this, but the word holy and sanctification are the same Greek word. Holy and sanctification. I, I've heard a lot of people say, well, you know, we can't be holy. Well, you can if you don't want to be. But if you want to be, you can. In other words, Peter lied. He says, be ye holy as he is holy. Huh? What does holiness mean? Same thing as sanctification. Set apart from sin, consecrated to God. God, I want to be holy. I want to be separated from sin. I just don't want to keep my same distance from the world as I did when I started out in 1966. I, I, want, I, want, I, want, to, I want to get further, closer to God and the closer I draw to God, and, and God doesn't draw us close to him, we draw close to God. He said, you draw, you draw close to me. But we do that with our will. If it was up to God, we'd all be holy. We'd all be righteous. We'd all be healed. We'd all be prosperous. And, it, and that's what God wants for us. But he made us free moral agents, so we have to choose that. And it's an act of our will that we want to draw close to God. And I talk to God on a daily basis. God, I want to be righteous. And I thank you that you have made me righteous. And I choose to live righteously. I choose to live holy. I want to be separated from sin. You know, see, most people don't even know what sin is. They don't know what sin is. They think sin is going out and shooting up, or sin is, well, a lot, a lot of things they used to think was sin, they don't think it's sin anymore. Drinking intoxicating drinks. A lot of sipping saints now. Back when I started out, you know, you couldn't be a sipping saint. You could sip water and Kool-Aid and orange juice, but not intoxicating drinks. Intoxicating, toxic. It's toxic. Huh? A lot of things they used to call sin don't call sin, but sin is very simple. Sin is self will. Sin is when you put your will over God's will. When you exert your will over God's will, you sin. Because sin is a decision. Sin is not just an act, sin is a decision. Jesus said in the old covenant, it had to be an act. But now that we're born again, Jesus said, if you look on to a woman, you look on a woman to lust after her, you committed adultery. That's a decision. Long before you committed the act of adultery, when you made the decision to pursue that, that's sin. See, God knows your thoughts and your intents, so you're not going to hide that from God. You might hide it from your spouse, but you're not going to hide it from God. Sin is always directed at God. Did you hear me? Sin is always directed at God. I'm not doing very good. I'm getting bogged down here. But sin is a decision. Sin's a choice. And that's why child training is so important because when your child exerts their will over your will, they've sinned. And when they exert, they, they put their will over your will, you're training them to put their will over God's will. Wow. Preaching pretty good here. Well, they're just two little ladies don't know what they're doing. They know well what they're doing. They got you figured out. They figured you out. <laughs> they figured you out before they learned the English language. <laughs> and they know good and well what they're doing. They're manipulative. Where'd they learn that from you? They'll cry them big crocodile tears, and they don't mean it. They don't mean a bit of it. Just as soon as you leave the room, they're going to go right back and start doing exactly what you told them not to do. If you don't train them up, if you don't discipline them, when you exert your will over God's will, that's sin. And God is very clear; it's black and white. 
what God wills for our life. This is his last will and testament. Huh? He didn't hide his word from us. He hid his word for us, and he's revealing it to those who will to know it. And I deliberately choose every day to keep this will renewed in my, my mind, renewed with it, so that I will know what his will is for my life. And I don't care what circumstance I face in life, I know this, that God's word trumps it. God's word is greater than that. So that is not the final saying. This is the final saying. God's word is the parent force of the universe. Well, that was an important statement. God's word is the, everything we see and don't see was created with God's word. And God's word is still present today for you and for me. Amen? Amen. Amen. So God was thinking generational. He always does. He thinks generational. Now, when I, when I see that um, God was talking about Timothy's grandmother and he's talking about his mother and he's talking about that same faith that was in your grandmother and then your mother's in you. So not only do we have a natural DNA, usually the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You know, that's why our children are not like us. And, uh, you know, our kids will say, how come you know all that? Because I, I'm an ex-kid. I used to be like you. <laughs> Where do you think you got that? You got that from me, <laughs> dude. I know how you think. I, I, you've never been 40, but I've been 13. But when God, when Paul was talking about Timothy's grandmother and his mother, and then he's talking about him, and I'm thinking about the spiritual DNA. You know God's spiritual DNA trumps our natural DNA? You need to feed on that. You know, my natural DNA was just like yours and everybody else's. It was filled with a lot of flaws. Huh? In our family tree, we had a lot of nuts. <laughs> and I'm doomed to repeat that if I don't get into the Word of God and discover what my spiritual DNA is. My natural DNA, I'm very impatient. My spiritual DNA, I'm very patient. My natural DNA, I'm not long-suffering. You know, just, just get to the point. My spiritual DNA, I'm very long-suffering. You got that? Natural DNA, I'm not very merciful, but my spiritual DNA, I'm very merciful. But I got to choose to let my spiritual DNA guide me instead of my natural DNA. That's just the way I am. Well, God can help you if you'll let him. He can, he can change you. Spiritual DNA trumps natural DNA. But you got to understand what your spiritual DNA is. God never consults your past to determine your future. So it doesn't matter how many nuts you have on your family tree. Well, I know exactly what he's going to be like. His daddy was like that. His granddaddy was like that. Well, so be it. But my father, heavenly father, is not like that. And I'm born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, full of the word of God. And the spiritual DNA triumphs, trumps all that. See, if you don't believe that, you can't be helped. No, I mean, some people, you know, like Or Roberts used to say, you can carry your Bible under your arm till it fuses to your armpit and it won't help you a bit. <laughs> but you got to get that word down into your spirit. You got to renew your mind with it and then get it under your spirit and start, quit acting like, I, I remember... <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I got it. We're going to be here all year. That's why notes help. But I think about, I think about generational. And I think about my dad's heritage. In my dad's family, there were 14 boys and five girls. And one of dad's brothers 
uh, his name is Roy Johnson, called him Uncle Roy, and he was a, the spiritual crown of that 14 boys, five girls. He was the spiritual crown. I remember at his memorial service, I got to preach. I was one of the three preachers that preached there, and then we had a graveside, and my nephew, Willie George, uh, he was asked to say a few words at the graveside, and that was his great uncle. And he said, you know, I've had the awesome opportunity to rub shoulders with some of the greatest men of God, Lester Sumrall, Kenneth Hagin, you know, Kenneth Copeland, those guys. I've had the awesome opportunity to rub shoulders and walk beside them, minister with them. He said, but I never, ever met an individual that carried the presence of God like my great uncle Roy. Wow, carried the presence of God. I mean, he walk in and I'm going to do right while he's here. It was just that, I mean, that, that was the kind of presence that he carried. And I can talk about that. But I remember as a young minister, my Uncle Roy setting me down. And I heard my dad talk about some of these things. But Uncle Roy was able to capsulize it better because of his spiritual components and his spiritual development in his life that my dad had not developed and he had. And so he was able to talk to me about those things and it just captivated me. And he, he's the only one that could call me Keithy and live. <laughs> he said, Keithy, he said, you got a great heritage. He said, your grandmother prayed for you. Your grandmother was a godly woman. Your grandmother was a great woman of faith. And he would tell me stories. And I, I'm not going to tell you all the stories he told me, but I'm going to tell you one story here today because it's pertinent to what I'm going to finish with. And this has to do with mothers. And he said uh, in World War I, one of my older brothers was lost at sea. And the Navy Department came out. They didn't have telephones back in those days. Telecommunications like they have now. Couldn't send us an email or a text. So they drove. They lived out in the hills of Missouri. And so a Navy Department car came driving on their property. And uh, a Naval officer came and said uh, to Grandpa and Grandma, we have come to let you know that there was a naval battle and uh, a U.S. ship that your son was on was sunk and your son has been lost at sea. And uh, grandmother, she, she believed in the power of prayer. She was referred to by many in her day as shout, a shouting, they were Methodist, but she was referred to as a shouting Methodist. Got a little emotional in her worship. And that was back when they'd wear their hair up, you know. You've seen pictures. Back in my day when I was a young man, it was bouffant. You know, those bouffant hairdos. Back in Grandma's day, they, they put their hair up. Had long hair, but they'd all put it up in buns. And, and she'd get happy in the Lord, and she'd shout her hair down. So they referred to her as a shouting Methodist. But she had, she had substance. It wasn't just emotion. She had substance. And he said, Grandma's altar, you understand with that many kids, you got to go find you an altar somewhere. And it was out behind the barn. And... Uh, so I remember it very, very distinctly. I remember we were out helping dad, which is my granddad. We were out helping him repair a wheel on a wagon. And grandma would go out behind that barn and pray, and she'd pray, and she'd pray. And she prayed over her son, so she, she believed. You know, prayer of faith. 
Not prayer with your fingers crossed, hopes. Prayer, prayer of faith. Faith is what makes prayer work. Yeah. Prayer doesn't make faith work. Faith makes prayer work. Faith has to do with what God has said. So when you pray what God has said, there's power in that. So she would decree and declare the word of God. She would pray those kind of prayers, not her emotions, not her feelings. Now, she might get emotional when she was praying, but that's not what she based her prayers on. Somebody said, well, I don't feel like my prayers accomplished much. See, that's based on your emotions and your feelings. The Bible says this is the confidence that we have in God. That when we ask anything, 1 Corinthians, 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15, this is the confidence that we have in God. When we ask anything according to his will, his will is his word. So when we ask anything according to his word, he hears us whether we feel like he hears us or not. He hears us. And then verse 15 says, because we know he hears us, then we know we have the petitions that we desired of him. Now where do we get that desire? We got it from the Bible. Life, a desire for life, that comes from God. God's the author of life. Not medical science, God. So she had prayed for home. She prayed for her boy. And she didn't accept this report. She, she didn't accept this. He's been lost. Well, he can be found if he's lost. But the Naval Department was saying lost means probably he's dead. He probably drowned at sea. But Grandma didn't receive that because she had the Word of God. So she would keep going out behind that barn praying, but one day they were out there working with Granddad, and Granddad wasn't a Christian at the time. But his day would come because Grandma was praying for him too. And so this particular day, Grandma came out from behind the barn, <coughs> excuse me, and she was singing. <laughs> and Granddad, not being a very spiritual man, but he knew his wife. And he turned and looked to his boys that were standing by him, the two or three that was there with him, and said, Boys, Homer's going to be okay. That's the big brother that was lost. Homer's going to be okay because Grandma's singing. She prayed till she got the victory. She prayed till she heard from heaven. And she heard from heaven. It said it was about two weeks later they saw that Navy car coming back. Praise God. And here it came, and they got out, and they said, we got good news for you. We found Homer. <laughs> Grandma already knew it. Grandma already knew it. Yeah. How'd she know it? Heaven told her. <laughs> when you hear from heaven, you don't need to hear from anybody else. You, you got God's word on the matter. Come on. Yeah. You got God's word on the matter. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Now, the... He told me stories like that. I mean, just, these weren't just incidents. You no, know, these weren't accidents. Yeah. I don't believe in accidents anyway. There's a cause and an effect for everything that happens. You might not intend it for it to happen, but if you hadn't lived the way you lived or had done what you'd done, it would have never happened. So there's a cause and an effect. Nothing just ever just happened. Oh, it just happened. No, it never just happens. I don't have time to preach that series. So in dad's, dad, my dad's family, my, my dad uh, loved God. My dad probably didn't have but about a fourth or fifth grade education. He was raised in the hills of Missouri and school wasn't all that important back then. And, and he was like a lot of kids, you know, work was more important. So they worked instead of going to school and 
So dad never, never was a good reader and never got into the Bible, never got into the Word. You got to get into the Word. Are you listening to me? You got to read your Bible. You got to read your Bible. I believe you ought to have a Bible. I mean, computers are wonderful. Computers are nice, but I believe you ought to have a Bible. You ought to have something you can make notes in and, and you can reference. Because when God talks to you, and I mean, my Bible is just full of notes. I mean, I've just got gazillions of notes and I can't write them all in there. So I've got volumes of books where I've journaled and made notes and I go back and refer to them because when God speaks to me, that's important. And I don't want to forget it. I can forget what you say and do all right, but I can't do I can't forget what God says and do all right. I need to know what God's word says on the matter. Amen. Now my dad wouldn't. He wasn't, he wasn't comfortable at reading. He wasn't a good reader, so therefore he didn't ge- keep his mind renewed. And he let things that he would see bother him. He would let things he, he heard bother him. And anyone that captures your attention will control your direction. Y'all write that down? That's a great truth. Whatever can capture your attention. That's why the Bible, that's why the Bible said, a good scripture, a good passage, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20. My son, uh, my daughter, my son, attend to my words. Proverbs 4, verse 20. My son. My daughter, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my saints. Why, 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 why ear? Because revelation comes by hearing. Revelation doesn't come by seeing. Revelation comes by hearing. Just look through the Bible from cover to cover and look at the emphasis God places on hearing. They, medical science tells you the last sense to go before you die is your hearing. God wants you to hear right up to the last second. Because if you can hear what God's saying, then you can make a decision. God wants you to hear. Let, let not, he says, attend to my word, incline that ear unto my sayings. Let it not depart from your eyes. Revelation comes by hearing. So when you hear, you see. Let it not depart. Now that you've heard it, you can see it. Why does God want you to hear it? Because he wants you to hear, he wants to affect your seeing, but you got to hear what he is saying so you can see as he sees. If we're hearing what everybody else is saying, we're seeing as they see. And it will cause us to react. God wants us to be proactive. Most of us are reactive. Because we let the natural circumstances of life dictate to us. I'm preaching really good. But we, 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 we see as a result of our hearing. I don't have time to flesh that up. Anyway. Let it not depart from your eyes. Keep it in the midst of your heart, your spirit. I didn't hear. Keep it in your heart. Why? Because it's life, this is Proverbs 4, 21, 22. It's life, what God's word, that revelation is life. Everybody say life. Life. To those that find it and health. That's where we get the word in the the Hebrew. That's a Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And that word health in Hebrew, in the margins of some of your study Bibles, it'll say medicine. And that's in the English where we get the word pharmacy. God's word is medicine. It's not just, it's not just an aspirin. It, it can be chemotherapy. It can be God's medicine. And God's medicine doesn't have side effects. You watch these advertising on TV, don't you? Take this, but they tell, tell you for 35 seconds the side effects of doing this. 
You may be blind, you may be deaf, you not, might not be able, you may, be, may commit suicide, but you won't have this. So God's word doesn't have side effects. It's life to all, it's health, it's medicine, it's pharmacy, it's medicine to all their flesh. That's why the word is so vitally important. Now, my dad, like I said, didn't, didn't, he let things bother him because he didn't read properly and didn't teach himself and didn't practice this and didn't renew his mind with the word of God like he should have and could have. Those are excuses. Excuses are for losers. I believe my dad was born again. But let me just say this about my dad. Both of his sons were preachers, me and my brother. That'd be Terry Lynn's dad. That'd be brother Jer Pastor Jeremy's granddad. Both his sons were preachers. Five of our grandchildren, five of my dad's grandchildren are preachers. One great-grandchild so far. There's more great-grandchildren coming up. They're still. But Jeremy's, Pastor Jeremy's one of the great-grandchildren. So there's eight preachers in my dad's spiritual DNA lineage. Woo! That's good, isn't it? Isn't that good? Say that's good. And I believe it started in Grandma Johnson. Now, not, not only Grandma Johnson, my grandmother, but also my mother, Grandma, was, was a spiritual godly woman, and she was greatly responsible for Terry Lynn's mother being saved. Amen. And then eventually my brother getting saved. Amen. It, it's, in your, it, 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 it's in our spiritual DNA lineage. So when I heard about grandmother, when I heard about her, her godly uh, her godly walk, her, her tenacity, her boldness, her perseverance. She just, she's like a bulldog on a bone. You can kill me, but you ain't getting my bone. You can do whatever you want to do to me, but you're not getting one of my children. If you don't believe that, it won't work for you. Some people are too lazy. They'd rather go try to make an extra buck so they can buy them some more stuff. We just moved just a year ago. We'd lived in a house for 25 years that we'd built on an acreage. So after our transition and I stepped aside from pastoring, we moved from our house, and I repented almost every day that we were downsizing of all the stuff that we had accumulated that we couldn't use. By the time we got it, we thought we had to have it. Isn't it amazing how we made your own minors and minor own majors? But the time you put into the Word, you'll always need that. You'll always use it. It's valuable and precious to you. Something that's valuable and precious, you would never part with it. We part it with lead crystal, a dining room table full of lead crystal. We were giving it away. I mean, we had valuables. We gave high what our children couldn't use, what we wasn't able to put in our condo that we moved into, we gave it. We just gave it. And at the time, you know, we thought, oh, man, that, this is so important. And, and you know, and it is something how we give our lives to the temporal. And then we minimize the eternal. The word, prayer. Come on, guys. Praying the word, that's eternal. 
and it pays eternal dividends. And the only thing that we have in our life that we possess that will transcend this life is our children. Our houses, our cars. Hey, listen to me. We've lived good. We rode good. And I believe in doing it. But listen to me. That is minor compared to the spiritual. And if you got to work extra hours just so you can get more material stuff, and it takes you away from the reading of the Word of God, it takes you away from your prayer life, it takes you away from your local church attendance, I'm telling you that's sin. Someone said, well, you're really condemning us here. No, I'm not condemning you. Your heart's condemning you right now. Instead of saying amen, you can say, oh, me. But you know what? As long as you got breath, you can change. And you can say, God, I, I want to start majoring on the majors and minoring on the minors. God, I, I want to start putting my time, the time's the most valuable commodity that I have, and it's getting away from me. And, and so, therefore, I want to make sure that I maximize my time. That's why Paul said, Ephesians chapter 5, redeeming the time. God. Do we ever need to redeem the time? Never before like 2018 because we don't have much time left. So my dad's heritage, there's eight preachers. Isn't that great? Look at the scripture they're going to put on the screen first. Samuel chapter 3, verse 19. First Samuel chapter 3. Did we, did we get that? So Samuel grew. Remember who Samuel was? His mother was a godly woman. Remember they said you can't have children. She was barren. And, but she was a woman of prayer like my grandmother was. And she prayed. Even the old prophet, he thought something was wrong with her. He thought she was getting, you know, a little up here but no she was she was travailing in prayer and she said i i, I got a word i got a god's word on the matter and i'm gonna have a child and she made a covenant with god and said i'll tell you what you give me you give me the child and i'll after our weaning i'll i'll give him to you and that's how samuel became the prophet of god he became so we know that great story but his mother hannah you know, and I was going to say this, and let me say it, because I, I think it's so important. And, and really, it, it, it's connected to everything I've already said. I think it's interesting to note that you can find numerous men who became great leaders in their field who didn't have good fathers, fathers who were not godly role models to their sons. But on the other hand, one would be hard-pressed to find Men who became great leaders, men who were very successful in their fields, who didn't have good mothers. In many instances, godly mothers who were responsible for establishing godly character in the lives of their sons and daughters. Isn't that true? Such was the case of Timothy. Such was the case of my grandmother. Such was the case of Samuel. Now notice what this verse says, because it's very pertinent to how I'm going to close with this story. Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. You read that, you know, and if you're just a casual reader of the Bible... You read that, and that doesn't turn you crank. What's happening? None of them fall to the ground. Meant the words he spoke didn't go without being fulfilled. Is that possible? Well, it is. If it's God's word on your lips, it is if you're praying the Bible and you're not praying your emotions and your feelings. If you're praying the word, come on somebody. If you're praying the Bible, if you're praying the word, 
The word never dies. The word is spirit. Jesus said, John 6, 63, the words that I speak to you, they're spirit and they're life. Spirit words never die. Spirit words, God's word is spirit and it produces life. It's a life-giving force. And you can, you can, you can, Inject life into death. I mean, I've been, I've been around death before and come in on the authority of the Word of God. I had a baby that died in the nursery in our church and they brought it to the back of the building and I was up here praying for people and they came and tugged on me and said, Pastor, Pastor, you're needed in the back. And I said, well, wait a minute, I'm praying. No, no, it's an emergency. So I said, excuse me, I go back there and there's a dead baby laying on the floor and it's already turned, you know, dark because babies turn real quick. And, and uh, the Spirit of the Lord, it was the gift of faith, came upon me. And I began to decree and declare the Word of God. I don't know. I, I, lost, I lost space. I, I lost uh, the consciousness of time. It had, when, you're, when you're engulfed in the gift of faith, now I operated in faith, but this was the gift of faith. It's different. And so I was operating in the gift of faith. And I began to decree and declare the Word of God. And as I just did that for however long I did, it didn't matter. Time's not the time. Faith is the constant. Time's the variable. <clears throat> but I did that. I didn't even lay hands on the baby. But all of a sudden, the baby began to <sighs> gasp and begin, begin to cry. And life came back into the baby. Are you listening to me? That wasn't Keith Johnson. That wasn't Keith Johnson that did that. That was the power of Almighty God. I'm, I've been in the presence of death before, and I have never been in awe of death, and I've never been overpowered by death. I've been overpowered by life. We have life on the inside of us, and we inject life into things. Yes. T.L. Osborne used to say, I'm so glad to get where God tells me to go because I know when I get there, God gets there. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. We just lost sight of who we are. We just think we're just a bunch of earthlings and we're just down here scratching out this and scratching. We're not like chickens. She can go out and scratch. We're not chickens. We're the redeemed of the Lord. We're king's kids. We walk on the high places of the earth. We live in triumph and victory. We're not under undertakers. Somebody says the Lord doesn't undertake. He's not an undertaker. He's an overcomer. I'm trying. Dear God, I'm trying. <laughs> now listen, I, I, I got stories I could tell you the rest of the day. My nephew, now he let none of his words, none of Samuel's words fell to the ground. Because when you speak the word of God, they're, in, they're infused with life and power. And they go on and on and on from generation to generation, from generation to generation, from t on and on. See, you don't know this. You need to know this. This is good news. So he said, well, go to a prayer meeting. Does it ever accomplish anything? It, it doesn't if you don't pray the word. If you'll pray the word, it accomplishes way more than you would ever think. And many times what we pray for, that this is because it doesn't come to pass in, in, in the next 24 hours or next week or next month, we think, well, that didn't do any good. Listen to me. Once you pray the word of God, it continues on and 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 on. And really eternity will only reveal the results of some people's prayers. They died and did not see the manifestation of what they were praying for. But that didn't mean it didn't manifest. Right. That didn't mean it didn't come to pass. And you can read that in the Hall of Fame of Faith there. My nephew, Willie George, who's one of those eight preachers, pastors a little church up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, about 12, 14,000 people. It's true. Just ask your pastor. He has seven services every weekend. And uh, back when he was early in his ministry, he was coming home from St. Louis, Missouri one night driving his car. And he was wanting to get home because he had things he had to do on Monday. So he drove from St. Louis back down to Tulsa. 
And he was coming to the area of Missouri where my dad was raised with Johnson clan. Come on, don't miss this. Don't, don't, don't miss this, please. If you've been asleep, wake up, wake up somebody. Come listen to this. And he's coming, he's driving this guy driving down the highway. And uh, he didn't have the radio on, he's not listening to tapes, he's just driving down the highway. And he said, all of a sudden, I hear a woman's voice. Are, we, are, you, are, are you still listening? Tanya. He hears a woman's voice, and he says, I didn't recognize her voice. It's called discerning of spirits. Are you listening? It's not the gift of suspicion. A lot of people ha operate in that. It's not a gift. That's a perversion. The discerning of spirits, it's when God permits you to see into or listen into the spirit realm. And you got to know, folks, the spirit realm is more real than this realm. I can look out here and see you and touch you, but this is temporal, but the spirit realm is eternal. Everything that I see here was made from something I can't see. Everything I see here is aging. Look at, look at all this. Aging, look at it. it, it it's... it's, it's it's aging, it's passing away, but in the eternal, it never passes away. Isn't it amazing how much stock we put in this? We put hardly no stock in that. Isn't that terrible? We need a readjustment. So he hears this voice, and he says, I, 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 I recognized it was a woman's voice. And I listened, and he said, I could understand she was praying and she was quoting scriptures and all of a sudden she began to utter names and you see grandma johnson died in 1938 this is 1991 or 92 hello she died in 38. This is in the early 90s. And he said, she began to utter names, and I began to recognize the names were some of my great uncles. And so I could hear she was praying for her boys. Remember Uncle Roy, my Uncle Roy told me, he said, Uncle, he said, Keithy, he said, Grandma prayed for you. Well, I wasn't born, I didn't discover America until 43. She died in 38. So she, she, you see, she's five years before I, I was born, but she prayed for me. Because she prayed for her children and her children's children and her and their children. She prayed for she she prayed for Jeremy. Isn't that wonderful? And so God permitted Willie George to listen in to that prayer. In her prayers, like Samuel's, her words never fell to the ground. They were still operative. Long after she went to glory, her prayers stayed earthbound, and they kept operating. Now, I can tell you stories. Listen to me. One of the, one of the worst brothers... And I knew it growing up, growing up. He was one of the worst of the Johnson boys. And he was meaner than a junkyard dog. He had been, he had been, he told me this story. He told me this story because he got, he got converted about the last three, four years of his life. Uncle Walter, they called him. His name was Walter. And Uncle Walter got saved. And I remember going to John Peter Smith Hospital in Fort Worth, Texas, and seeing my Uncle Walter there. And he was supposed to be on his deathbed, and he had wires on, tubes going everywhere. And I walked in, and he raised up in his bed and I said, Oh, Walter, oh, no, it's good to see you. And I don't know if he jerked tubes out of him or what. You know, he's tough. Dear God, he was tough. But he gave his heart to the Lord, and he lived, he lived a, a good, healthy life for three years after he got out of that supposed to have been deathbed, but he told me this story. He said, I was in San Francisco, and I went out on the Golden Gate Bridge and was going to commit suicide. 
And there are spirits that, that hover in places like that. It, just, just like up at uh, Niagara Falls, there's people that jump. And, and there are spirits. A lot, a lot of times the, they're depressed or something, but they'll go up there and look at the falls, and that spirit will come up on them, and, and they'll jump. They'll give in to that spirit. They don't know how to resist that. Are you listening? Those spirits, I'm talking about their spirits of death and their spirits of life. Grandma, she infused spirits of life into the world, into the atmosphere over her children. And he said, as I was preparing to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge, commit suicide, my mother's face appeared before me. And her prayers came to me and she was praying for me. I crawled back over that railing there and I walked back in. And I didn't commit suicide like I was about to because I heard my mother's prayers. See, God permitted Walter to hear that and see that. And Grandma had prayed that years and years earlier and she was already gone. But her prayers never left. Now you say, oh, I don't believe that. Well, <laughs> pity you. <laughs> All things are possible to believers, not unbelievers. Yeah. All things are possible to believe. I'm telling you the word of God. And if you have the rest of the day, and I know you don't, but if you have the rest of the day, I can show you many scriptures, many scriptures that support everything that I've said and things that I'm talking about right now. But I'm here to tell you the good news, mothers. You play a bigger role in the life of your family than you could ever imagine. Do you think my grandmother, when she died in 1930, now, now she, she, she had, a, she had a, a, an agreement with God about her, her husband. And two weeks before she died, she got to see him get up and walk an aisle and kneel at a mourner's bench and give his heart to the Lord two weeks before she died. Huh? She died with a smile on her face. Because the kingpin that she was after was her husband. And he gave his heart to the Lord two weeks before she died. God let her see that finished work. But she didn't see a lot of her finished work. She didn't see the finish of a lot of her prayers until glory. But listen, when my uncle Walter passed away and he went into glory... Don't you know his mama was there to greet him? I'm telling you, folks, that the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And what I'm talking to mothers about today is that you hold within your grasp the ability to affect the destiny of your family. You can't do it with money. In fact, many times trying to do it with money will ruin it. But if you'll use the spiritual components that God has given to your, at your, that are at your disposal, if you'd use those spiritual components and you begin to pray the word, speak the word, and don't ever go back on it. I don't care what you see. I don't care what you hear. The reports. The negativity, regardless, keep praying the word of God. Keep praying the word of God. Keep speaking the word of God. Keep, keep declaring the word of God. And those words will never fall to the ground. Isn't that wonderful? I like for the mothers... I'd like for the mothers to stand today. I want the mothers to stand. Now, I know some of you, you got young children. Some of your children are older. Some of your children may be serving God. Some of your children may not be serving God. Irregardless of the status of your, of your children, of your family members, you can take courage from God's word that if they got a good life, it can be better. If it's not going good, it can be reversed. Huh? You never, never lose hope. Said about Abraham, when all hope was gone, he went ahead, hoped in God. Huh? Wasn't anything in the natural to hang his hope on, but he hung his hope on the Word. You can hang your hope on the Word.
But better than you hope, use your faith. Your faith is your God-given ability to act on the revealed Word of God. Get into the Bible and get you two, three, four, five, six scriptures that has that, that speaks about your children, that speaks about your family, that speak about your authority as a godly mother and as a godly as a Christian, as a believer. Just begin to write those scriptures out because it's the word of God that has the power, God, ladies. It's the word of God. It's not your spirituality. It's the word of God that has the power. But if you'll release that power, that anointing, praise God. There's an authority in a mother's life that even pastor doesn't have in your child's life. I, I know I've been there. I, I, I pulled alongside family members and prayed for their lost children and so forth. But there's an authority about a parent that a parent has that nobody outside that family has. And I'm here to tell you that you and God are a majority. And all you need to see a victory is just you exercising your faith in God's Word, decreeing that and declaring that, and let God work with you to bring them in. I want you to just lift your hearts to God right now <coughs> and say, God, I want you to help me understand what I've heard today. And I want to be a doer of what I've heard today. Your pastor said that this morning before he turned the service to me. Well, we got to be doers of what we've been experiencing here in this auditorium. you got to be a doer of this word. But if you'll be a doer, I promise you, you'll be like Sarah. He who laughs, last, laughs the best you'll have the last laugh. Amen. It may be in the next life when you get it, but I'll tell you what, you're going to have a laugh because you're going to see God work a miracle in your behalf. Father, I speak over the moms. I speak over the women in this congregation right now. God, you know their circumstances. You know their situation. I have no idea what they're facing. I have no idea what's going on with their offspring. I do not know that. It could be Mama's praying for children. could be grandparents praying for grandchildren. I do not know their circumstances, but you do. But God, I pray that they have heard and gotten revelation of what I talked about today, what I preached. And they'll take a hold of this word and they'll act upon it. And they'll begin to infuse life into that circumstance. They'll begin to infuse life. And we'll see miracles take place, Lord. We'll hear phenomenal miracle reports people that have been transformed by the almighty power of God and it'll be the results of these mothers praying these grandmothers praying it'll be the result of them acting on your word and working together with you to destroy the yoke of bondage that's trying to destroy that loved one and that child that family member I thank you for it I pray that this day will be a glorious day for every mom present here in this service today. Thank you, Lord. They're going to leave here with great, great rejoicing because they, they're going to be able to see as you see because they heard something that you had to say. And they see it completely different than what they did before they came into this building today. And I give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for allowing me to be here today. If you'll wait just one second, um, you can be seated. And um, we recognize that there are some of you here today who Mother's Day is not always the happiest of times. Sometimes there's memories of children who are already uh, have been with Jesus, whether that's miscarriage, whether that's sickness or illness or injury, that the, your children have gone on. And we just want you to know, and we have a, a flower. If you're here and that's speaking to you, if you would just lift your hand. Um, we're giving you a silk flower today, and it has a card. And on the card, it says, a mother's not defined by the number of children she has, but by the love that she carries in her heart. And we just want you to know that 
the love and the memories and the, and the faith that you have for your children, though they're with Jesus, God sees you. And he says he draws near to the brokenhearted. So our hearts are with you today as well. Did you receive something from the Lord today? Amen, amen. Praise God. Let's give the Lord praise one more time in this house. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. God. Amen. If you're visiting with us today, please be sure to take your orange guest card to the Connection Center. Me and uh, the First Lady, uh, Miss Tanya, we want to we wanna greet you. We want to say thank you for being here today. What a great day it's been. Moms, happy Mother's Day. We bless you in the mighty name of Jesus. Let's all stand to our feet. Today, before we leave, uh, we're going to be putting up offering baskets here. If you feel compelled in your heart to give to our guest minister today, we want to give you that opportunity to do that. How many know that, that it's good seed sown when you sow into the lives of people that bring the good news to us? Amen. Today was good news that your words aren't going to die. Amen. But your words are life and they'll never fall if you speak them in Hallelujah. Let me bless you today. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your blessings upon our lives. We thank you for the word that has been spoken. It hasn't fallen upon hard ground, but it's fallen upon fertile soil. And it will bring forth the 30, 60, and 100 fold return in our lives. We bless the moms here today. And I thank you, Lord, that wherever. Uh, whatever is going on in their lives today, may they feel your love and your grace and your peace upon their hearts and their minds. May they know that they are loved by you. Furthermore, may they know they're loved by their loved ones today. Lord, we bless you and we thank you for, for all that you're doing. A great week ahead. I call these people the head, not the tail. The above only and not beneath. I thank you, Lord, that everything they set their hand to do prospers. And they have favor with you, God, but they also have favor with me. And Lord, I thank you for your angels that encamp around about them. Keep them in all their ways. And we all said, Amen. Hey, church, great days.